Books with Brooks. This is Brooks. I am here, joined here today uh, virtually by my friend Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Oh, we are ready to discuss our July book club book, which is Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. This book is a New York Times bestseller, a Reese's book club pick, which I actually think is how we ended up picking it. Um, at last month's book club, I asked for suggestions and this was one of them. And then we kind of voted and this sort of bubbled to the top. Um, it had been on my list for a really long time. It came out in 2019 um, by Penguin, no, Putnam. Yeah. Penguin Random House Putnam. And um, yeah, I'd had this on my list for a long time. For some reason, I'd just never gotten my hands on it. So when it came up, I was really excited to pick it up. It got a lot of critical acclaim. Um, and and yeah, Carrie, were you aware of this book before we picked it? I was. So I read it actually, I think maybe sometime last year. Um, so I, I did read it again. Um, for book club tomorrow and for this conversation and I just finished it today so it's very fresh in my mind but I kind of liked actually reading it twice because I feel like I didn't remember it as well the first time but um, definitely more perceptive the second time oh awesome wait when did you read it the first time I want to say sometime last year I think Uh Great, yes great, great, great. last year oh yeah that's cool okay cool so I'll be really interested to see um, what you thought the second time around yep Thanks for reading it again. What an overachiever you are. <laughs> well, it was available at the library and they got it to me in time. So oh, good. Uh, yeah. yeah. A, a plus book club student over here. Dang. Gold star. <laughs> <clears throat> Did you, you read it. You didn't listen on audiobook, right? Right. Yeah. I read it. So I kind of feel like with this book, I just want to do a small disclaimer, which is that I am a white person. I'm a pretty affluent white person. And this is a book that deals a lot with race and affluence and white privilege And so I just want to acknowledge that going in and there may be points in the book that make white people feel defensive or uncomfortable. Um, And I think that is on purpose uh, and it's good. So I don't know. I just feel Mm -hmm. like with this one, we're dealing with like a really, a lot of like really hyper, um, like sensitive racial topics and like real it's this book is kind of like about like like microaggressions and just like the small things in a daily life that um like can be weird racially or like socioeconomically um so that's just a little disclaimer that I have absolutely I I agree I think there's a lot um to talk about with this book so I'm excited to get into it (laughs) yeah me too okay first question first question did you like the book yes or no I'll give it a yes, but if I had to choose, I would say I'd be in the middle. Oh, very interesting. Okay, yes. okay. I'm giving it a yes. I really enjoyed it. Um, I didn't think it was perfect. I mean, what book is? But mm-hmm. uh, I definitely enjoyed reading it. Um, I felt like I really connected with some of the characters. Um, there were some really, there were some really funny and like very heartfelt moments that I really liked. And overall, yeah, I liked it. I'll give it a yes. Thumbs up from me. Why, Carrie, why are you kind of in the middle? Okay, I agree with everything you said, and I liked all of those things too. Sometimes it is hard for me to overcome when, like like you said, like no book is perfect. Um, there were some things in this book where I think could have, I don't know. I feel like the character development was good, but there were times when I felt like there was a lot of description about the actions of people in a scene or a lot of description of a conversation that actually didn't have much to add to the plot. And I feel like the author was doing this in order to really paint um, the feeling of a situation, but sometimes it became distracting in a way that I was like, okay, okay, I get it. Like, you know, what is actually happening? Interesting. Do you have, did you mark an example by chance? I would love to hear an example. Yes. So, okay. So the part of the Thanksgiving dinner which mm-hmm. is extremely like high tension, uh, a very high tension moment. Um, there's a lot of anxiety in the air. And I felt like um, the author spent a lot of time, even though there was a lot happening, but like when they're at the Thanksgiving table, she spent a lot of time being like, and then Briar did this. And then Catherine did this. And I think she was trying to paint a picture of like, this is a chaotic scene. But after a while, there was so much like little things like that, that I felt were interjected. And I was like, okay, what is actually going to happen here? Because I get that this is a chaotic scene, 
I don't need to know like every little thing that's happening because it's not necessarily contributing to the story. Yeah, I get that. I also think, um, which this might be, maybe this is, maybe I'm just connecting topics that are unrelated, but I have been watching on Netflix, um, White Lotus. Okay. It's not, wait, I think it's on HBO actually. I think it's on HBO. It's called White Lotus and it is a, it's a series and I'm on episode three they're released weekly and I'm like what is this show about and I feel <laughs> like with this and what I'm really enjoying it and like the characters are super compelling and it's beautifully shot and like it's very funny and it's kind of a dark comedy but it's also like I'm having this feeling of like what is this about and I had a similar reaction to this book especially in like the first third of it it was a lot of like mm -hmm. okay what is this about what is this book going to be about like what what's our rising action? Like what, what, like what's, ha what's going to happen? Like, I just kind of couldn't tell, I couldn't feel it out. And I don't know if that's maybe like a new trend in media or something, but I feel like I've come across a few shows and books lately that I feel that way about where it's just kind of like, what is this about? Like, what is the plot? Like, is there a beginning and a middle and an end? Or is this just a character study? Yes. I totally agree with you because um, I felt like there was a lot of really good content set up in this book and the story was like pretty interesting, but I found myself asking like, what is the message here? Like, what does the author want me as a reader to get out of this or like take away? And I feel like that was more abstract. I couldn't exactly put my finger on it. Yeah. Which also reminds me that we didn't really do a plot rundown, which we should probably oh. do. <laughs> For people okay. who haven't read the book or who read it kind of a long time ago and don't really remember, Carrie, do you want to kind of describe? Yes. Um, okay. So the main character's name is, I believe, pronounced Amira. That's how I read it. Is that how you read it? I think I was saying Imira. Imira. Yeah, essentially okay. Imira. Imira. Yeah. Amira. Okay. Imira. So she is, I think, 25, 26. She's an African-American female. She lives in um, New York City. Long story short, she is like- in Wait, this no, Philadelphia. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. It is Philadelphia. Yeah, which okay, that yeah, was actually right. really confusing to me initially, yes. but yeah, they're in Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. She's in Philadelphia. She went to college, but she's not quite sure what her calling is. So she's working as a babysitter for this um, family and they happen to be white. They're quite well off. And the book kind of starts with this contentious scene where- um, you know, probably similar to things that we've seen in the news. Um, Amira is babysitting um, and she is mistaken as like, is she actually the babysitter because she's black and the child that she's caring for is white. And they are in a place, I think like late at night. Um, and so people are like questioning her validity essentially. And so it kind of turns into the seed. There's a video of it. She doesn't want it to be released. And then there's a lot of different tensions as she kind of navigates her way through how do I deal with this white family that I work for, that I really enjoy working for, but like, do I really want to continue doing that? I'm, you know, coming of age kind of thing. And then she, at the same time, she starts dating someone who was a part of this contentious racially charged scene in the beginning. And then their relationship becomes tied to the family that Amira is babysitting for. I don't know that's like a very very brief brief summary yeah. no that was of... really good that was really good okay. and I think yeah that was a great explanation and I think especially because we were just talking about like what is this book about like um that was a really good explanation because the book isn't real like it doesn't have like a really sp specific beginning middle and end like traditional yes. plot line so that was great and I think and I know I've talked to a couple of people in book club including my mom about this but and I think we complain about this pretty regularly about the marketing of books not always aligning perfectly with what the book itself ends up giving you and ends up delivering and I think this one is one they kind of missed the mark like I picked up this book expecting it to be because they describe it this way about a black woman who hit who is um falsely accused of kidnapping a toddler so I thought this was going to be almost like a mystery mm -hmm. not a murder mystery but like a mystery about 
a woman who didn't commit a crime that she's being accused of committing. And that is not at all what this book is. Like she's not arrested for that. And I'm not trying to downplay it. Like it is a horrible thing that happens to her and it's traumatic in a lot of ways. And it's really like racially, you know, inappropriate, but, but it's not a book about someone who like the child doesn't ever go missing. Like it's not, there's no kidnapping in -hmm. the way that I thought I like interpreted the word kidnapping. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So I kept, even after that scene ended, I kept thinking, well, is she going to get kidnapped? Like, well, so is she going to get snatched on the way out of the store? Is she getting snatched the next day? Is there another incident where she gets kidnapped? Like, when does she get kidnapped? <laughs> and like, she, she never gets kidnapped. And I was like, oh, so it's not, okay. It is about that, but like not in the way that I thought it was going to be about that. Yeah. And that's not even the, what ends up being the focal point of the book. Yeah. Like it kind of is the first thing that happens. I think it introduces us to a lot of the characters and gives a good representation of some of the themes that we'll end up hearing about in the book. But then it goes, but you know, the story goes off in so many other directions. Yeah. So that was a really good plot rundown of a book that we are not sure what the plot is. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's actually okay. so many plots. <laughs> there are, there's a lot of plots. What um, do we think of the first sentence? The first sentence is, that night when Mrs. Chamberlain called, Amira could only piece together the words, take Briar somewhere and pay you double. Hmm. What do we think? I feel like when I picked this book up again, I didn't quite remember what it was about. Like I kind of did. But then when I read that first sentence, I was like, oh yeah, I do remember what happened. Oh, that made it all come (laughs) back, huh? Yeah. Um, but from a first perspective, well, now it's hard for me to remember the first perspective. What was your first perspective? Um, I mean, I think there was a lot of telltale things in here. Like the fact that we use the term Mrs. Chamberlain as a moniker, but then we get Amira and then we get the name of someone else and then pay you double. Like, I think it really does illustrate, gives us a ton of information about their relationship, which is you know, it's a, tr- it's transactional. It's based on money. Like she's being paid to do something and she's being bribed to do something more. Right. Mm, Which I yes. think is kind of like a theme of this book is like, what can money buy you? And what will you do for money? Right. Sort of like, how far are you willing to compromise your own dreams and aspirations and principles for money? That's a very good way of thinking of it. I like that. I mean, because think about it. Somebody calls you up and says, I'll pay you double. It's really hard to say no to that always, right? Right. Very Like paying someone double is like a lot. I mean, that's big incentive. You really need their help. Like you're in a bind, obviously you're going to pay them double. Um, Right. Yeah. I think it's a good, I think it's a good first sentence. I think it gives us a ton of information um, and really establishes this like payment based relationship. Yeah, I agree. It is a good sentence. Which Mrs. Chamberlain is always fighting against that through the whole book. And she wants them to be more like friends or more like family. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, ultimately you're paying her. You're paying her. Right. And it would be different if Amira wanted it to be that way, but she very clearly does not want it to be anything more than transactional. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, What do you think about the title of this book? Such a fun age. You know what? I ended up, I, I really like the title. Um, it doesn't actually tell you anything about what to expect no, unless you nothing. read, yeah, unless you read like a synopsis or something about like on the inside cover. But I think now in retrospect, having read the book, I like that it's called Such a Fun Age because it's sarcastic. And obviously we are beyond the years of 25, 26 years old. Um, but it makes me kind of remember that time you know, or, or whenever that time is in your life, that's just the, that's just Amira's age in this book, but that time in your life where you're not sure of like, um, you know, I'm not sure what to do and I'm not going to be on my parents' health insurance. And like, should I take that job? And like, do I do something because it adds more money or do I do the thing that like is supposed to like help me build a career? And there's just so many unanswered questions. And it's like, you know, a lot of people I think say, you know, oh, you know, being young, being young is just so much fun. It's the best years of your life. But at the same time, it's kind of stressful. There's so many unknowns. 
Yeah, and it sure. puts a lot of pressure, I think, on people when, you know, when you're young and you're like trying to figure it out and you're supposed to be having the time of your life. But I'm like, this seems really hard as I wade through, you know, trying to find what my calling is or what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I thought the title very much encapsulated, you know, some of that feeling, especially for Amira, because, you know, you do hear about her struggles in this in many different ways. And it's just it's funny because it is such a fun age, but then at the same time, you, you see her not having so much fun in some ways. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Great. That's, I agree with you totally. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up, I have that in here as a question, the, all the mentions to health insurance. And it's yeah. really funny to me. That is like this, like, test this litmus test of like are you an adult yet is it Mm -hmm. is are you off your parents health insurance which is very sad to me yeah and I hate that we are in that situation as a country like there's no reason for it to be that way but um it is and so and I remember that too of like well shit I gotta get a job with health insurance right there's this looming deadline And it does feel like you got to figure it all out by 26 or else you're going to be without health insurance. And then what will you do? Yeah. Oh, don't get me started on health insurance. I have so much to say about it. Uh, I know. But yes, it is a health insurance podcast. (laughs) But um, no, I I agree. I think there's um, this path for people. You know, you go to high school, then you go to college, get a job. And then like, maybe if you go down the road of like relationships, there's marriage and children, family, whatever. But if you stay on that track of career and school, you know, I really think the next thing is the health insurance piece, you know, whether you're, um, if you're 26, are you still on your parents' health insurance and therefore kind of dependent? Um, I think that is a good kind of way to think about it. And it definitely plays into Amira's decision-making, especially when it comes to whether she should continue babysitting in this book. Hello, this is Don Mike Mendoza, the host of the Producing While Asian podcast. Join us to listen in on conversations with everyone who identify from producers to non-producers who all are part of the AAPI community. There's all that and more on the Producing While Asian podcast here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Okay, this has nothing to do with the plot, but it (laughs) really bothered me (laughs) on page 80. Okay, at some point, Mrs. Chamberlain gives Amira a bottle of wine that they like drink only like one glass of. And then she's like, you should take it, like take it to dinner or whatever um, with you. And she's like, oh, wow. And they're like raving about how good it is and how expensive it is and all this stuff. And then like, like the entire chapter, they're raving about this expensive, delicious wine. And then they say it's from Michigan. Oh, (laughs) I was like I don't think so oh my gosh (laughs) I've had Michigan wine it's not good it's um and it's not expensive (laughs) that is okay so when little things like that happen in the book I feel like it just like it devalues the book because I'm like that would never happen yeah 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 that that like really bothered me because I don't think Michigan wine is nice and they were it was like a huge like part like they were ma- the characters were making such a big deal out of this wine and I was just like no oh I don't believe it okay that has nothing to do with the plot um <laughs> just something that bothered me all right on page 109 we get for the first time I think kind of the full story of what happened when Kelly broke up with Alex in high school yes and I want to talk about it because I had kind of a visceral reaction to this. Okay. Um, like, I really felt like this guy is a fucking jerk. Like, what a jerk. Mm-hmm. Um, which is great. Like, I think this book does a great job of sort of, I mean, I think Mrs. Chamberlain is our like main villain, certainly. Mm-hmm. But um, even she has, well, you know, a lot of redeeming qualities and like, you can kind of see both sides in a lot of situations. And I think this one, especially like you really can see both sides of this high school breakup and how it happened Mm -hmm. and how they both feel very like righteous in their side of it. Mm -hmm. But when, when in reality, they're like both kind of dicks, Yeah, like they both really didn't handle it well, but in my opinion, maybe this is because I'm a woman and maybe this is because I'm a white woman. 
um but i felt like he was just a total asshole to her (laughs) yeah and i like kind of didn't blame her for like still holding a grudge against him because he really like it this so basically he breaks up with her basically he breaks up with her on a monday morning he says it says kelly broke up with alex on the following monday just after first period and five days before prom like even that is like oh like a punch to my gut like remember what that was like like getting ready for prom and you've got your dress and you have your plans and you have your limo and like if my date dumped me five days before prom like I would be furious yeah I hear you that's unacceptable yeah then he goes on to say or this is how he does it he says hey don't be mad but I think I'm gonna go to prom with Robbie's cousin Sasha yeah. So not only is he not taking her to prom, he's still going with someone else. Wait, and like, no way, man. No way. Huge. This is a spoiler. So warning, if you haven't read the book, let's keep in mind that this happens after the first time they've ever had sex. Yes. This is the like first the Monday time. after she loses her virginity to him. Yep. Yeah. And then he doesn't return her calls all weekend. And then he tells her he's going to go with someone else to prom five days before prom. Yeah. Like, I don't, I mean, that's that's hard to get over. Yeah, that's not good. That's tough. That's a tough situation. Yes. At the same time, I want to be like, they're in high school. He's an idiot. Yes, definitely. And in retrospect, like, Okay, I feel like these are two pieces because if they hadn't had sex just now for the first time, it'd be like, yeah, that's really, really not good form on his part, like to not go to prom with her. But why is he going out with someone else? But then when you add on top of that, you know, the intimacy they just shared is just like, like, where is this coming from? It almost seems vindictive on Kelly's part to like yeah. do such a 180 on Alex. Yeah. Like, he obviously didn't love her. He obviously didn't even really like her. If it's this easy for him to just be like, nah, you know what? Never mind. Like, right. forget this. Like, this thing we've been planning all year, this was supposed to be the culmination of, like, our entire high school experience and our relationship. Like, nah, I'm just not going to do it. Like, whew, yeah, that's tough. Yes. But we haven't talked about what Alex did. Right. Which is also, like pretty bad but on the same vein like I I don't know I just I found myself sympathizing with her more in both of these situations yes I agree with you um I so what Alex did in this situation is she sent this letter to Kelly she told him basically she wanted to lose her virginity to him and it was going to be this really special night he claims he never got this letter and instead um the, it fell into the wrong hands this popular group at school they show up at alex's house and they like want to have a party and she's like this is very unacceptable my parents are out of town she calls the cops and one of the guys loses his like scholarship because he gets in trouble with the police and kelly is basically upset with alex for doing this and i think this kind of brings forth a lot of things that are kind of problematic about Alex but it's very hard to pick apart because I I agree I see both sides especially in that situation that becomes such a turning point for her life at the same time um, I feel that Alex is a very like obsessive person the way she talks about her like the way she writes letters to her high school boyfriend like all the time I'm like, okay, that's a little bit much. Like, it's very clear that you like him way more than he likes you. And then later in the book with um, Amira as her babysitter, it's like she has this same obsession and it's almost like it's not even about that person. It's not about Amira. It's not about Kelly. It's like she has this thing where she needs to feel justified in what she is doing so that she can feel like righteous. I'm not sure what it is yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a question that I have is like, what is Alex's like motivation? Like, what is, she, like, why is she trying so hard to befriend Amira? Like, wh- what, what is, yeah, like, what is her motivation? And I don't, I don't really know the answer. Right. I, I wrote that question down as well. I wrote, why is Alex so obsessed with Amira? 
Um, yeah. Like she's really obsessed with her and it, it, and it, it's so extreme at points that I'm like, is she going to murder her? Like, is this a book about a murder? Like it feels like it's leading somewhere, but then it kind of, I mean, and it does, she does do something like really horrible in the end, but I don't know. It almost read to me like, yeah, like a really evil villain who's about to like, murder someone I don't know (laughs) yeah yeah she just like okay so at first I thought okay Alex seems to be obsessed with Amira because Amira is younger she's not married she doesn't have kids like is she obsessed with her because it Amira reminds Alex of her own young life and I could see Mm. that I could understand that because I'm like okay Mm -hmm. you know she's she's married she doesn't live in New York City anymore the where where she really like thrived and loved that like go 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 um career and lifestyle and now she doesn't have that anymore and here's this um younger girl who is you know she's dating and she you know it's kind of like the world is her oyster um kind of thought process and so Alex is very much like invested in it because she's just so curious she hasn't had that uh she hasn't had that excitement for so long yeah that's a really I like that a lot I like that interpretation and I think that could explain it Mm -hmm. but then it I agree it gets it gets so much more than that I feel that Alex is someone who needs to feel I don't know like she's doing good by other people like she is someone who cannot be the bad guy yeah definitely yeah and she's always this is something I noted too she's always like getting validation from her friend group Mm. she has this like diverse group of friends and so she's always checking in with them like both on racial issues but also on like socioeconomic issues like she's always checking in kind of being like is it okay if I like ask the help to xyz thing like Mm -hmm. um or is it weird if I like ask her to whatever whatever and to get them to be like no no my nanny does that all the time or like my housekeeper does this or like my whatever does this so it's like what are the bound she's always trying to like validate what the boundaries are between her and the people she pays right yeah I mean yeah which is interesting. And her friends, like her friends really do seem to agree with her and validate her. And like, even her like black friends do. And her black friends tell her she's doing the right thing over and over um, and stuff. So I think the book is also maybe commenting on like the, you know, the age gap between people of similar races, like can still lead to like big differences, right. And like yes. how you approach life, how you approach race, how you approach relationships like there there's a different there's an age gap and so they like don't read situations the same way yeah and that was something that really bothered me because Alex has a friend who is black her name is Tamra and she seems to like take it upon herself at Thanksgiving dinner to grill Amira about like what she wants to do with her life and what are your main goals and it's just like I feel like I understood what she was trying to do but at the same time it kind of made me really annoyed because I was like, okay, just because you're black and Amira is black, like it, I mean, I don't know. I feel like there were so many things that brought up um, in me. I thought like, I understand that people who may have grown up the same way or in a similar way or be of the same race, there are, and I would be foolish to, um, I would be foolish to deny this, that there may be some more shared similarities or thinking or thought processes that are more similar than with someone of a different upbringing or socioeconomic status or race. That doesn't mean that I think you should treat other people in a way that defines them in those categories. And I felt that there were times that Tamara did that where I was like, all right, I know that you're black and she's black. And so you feel like this kinship at the same time, you don't actually know Amira. So you need to let Amira like speak her voice. And, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, she necessarily needs your guidance. She's not asking for your guidance. I I was really annoyed by that. Yeah, I agree. I feel like there were a lot of points in this book where that happened, where it was like, I felt the author did a really good job of, you know, making this book lighthearted and funny. And especially with Amira's friend group, I feel like she did a good job. I loved them. I loved them. Yes. Those were some of my favorite characters. Yeah. I really liked their, oh, like the scene where it's her birthday. She finds out the video has been leaked and her friends literally just like swoop in, like take Kelly's phone, get an Uber, 
get out of this bar. Like the way they handled that situation, I literally wanted to applaud. At the same time, I felt like there were moments where the author were the author was giving them uh, things to say or things to do that very much categorized them as a certain kind of person. And I'm like, are you trying to character build or are you trying to write this in a way that you think a young black woman would be like? And is every young black woman like that? Or are you using, I don't want to say stereotypes, but um, are you using things that you think are what a young black woman be like? It, I don't know. I feel like it can be a very touchy subject. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, I certainly don't know the answers to those questions. Um, yeah. I don't know. But I did, I mean, as a reader, as a white reader, I thought I enjoyed reading the relationships between the girls. Like, Mm -hmm. Tamara was so funny and so supportive as a friend and like their little their way that they text and stay in touch and like show up for each other was extremely endearing yes um and it does remind you of that time in your life where like your friends are your family you know and they're all you've got and they got to show up for you and you got to show up for each other and and you know it was interesting too the like jealousy between them Oh my gosh, it was um, so this, like, cute. Feelings of inferiority. I mean, I remember all of that stuff too, of like where you really compare yourself against your friends and well, this friend got a new job and now she's making this and now she's going to move into this really nice apartment, but I still live in this shitty apartment. And like, yeah, I mean, you know, we've all felt those feelings. Right. Um, and they're very acute and like, you know, and they ru- can ruin your night. Like that whole scene where the friend gets a promotion and then she doesn't, but she doesn't feel like partying and the other friend tells her to get her shit together. You got to be happy for her. And it's like, of course I have to be happy for her, but you have to get over that initial like self-comparison. Want to hear more about your favorite TV shows and movies that are on countless streaming services? Then listen to Up Next with your new favorite hosts, me, Kristen Aviles. And me, Christina Walter. Every other week, we'll highlight one genre, but two movies or TV shows, one old and one new. We'll let you know what's hot and what's not from your favorite or least favorite streaming services. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of each episode where we shout out an artist whose name you should know for their talent in the industry. So follow us to stay up to date with your favorite hosts from Up Next, a part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Um, so big time spoilers as we get to the end of this book. Um, so I'll just announce that one more time. But I mean, so much happens. There's a ton of stuff that happens in the climax. And I don't really think we need to get into the weeds and all of it. But I thought that the ending was really interesting in that this book is not a love story. And in the end, Amira and Kelly don't end up together. What what did you think about that, Carrie? I actually liked it. I thought it was realistic. You know how you watch a movie yeah. and you like always expect mm-hmm. a happy ending, but then it's kind of nice when something happens and you're like, oh yeah, that's kind of how real life would be. Yeah. I think it was actually a mature decision for Amira to not get back together with him. And it's it's interesting because I feel like I'm a little bit of a romantic. And if I had been in her position, I feel like I'm kind of weak and I would have like gone back to him <laughs> because ultimately he didn't wrong her in any way but they had this huge fight and she was so sure of something and she ended up being wrong and I think in the book she says something like I knew that we would never be able to like go back because if we did get back together every time something happened he would think that he was right and he would feel more justified because of this huge thing and it just like wouldn't be a good dynamic for our relationship if he always thought he was right and I thought that was really mature. Yeah, that's quite astute. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I think in terms of like, but I think that, I mean, it definitely fit the story, which is that this wasn't like your typical, this is not a fairy tale. Like this doesn't have like a really specific beginning, middle and end. Like it isn't a rom-com. Um, so I thought it fit the book, but I did find it a little dis- a little bit unfulfilling as a reader because I I did kind of want them to have a reconciliation like I did really like their relationship I thought it was like very sweet and genuine same it was very sweet and he was really hot like come on he was so hot everyone (laughs) couldn't stop talking about how hot he was and so tall (laughs) and so tall and he had a great apartment I mean come on these are like great these are great attributes especially when you're 26 yes um 
So I did kind of miss that just from a storytelling perspective. Like, could we have brought it full circle and could they have reconciled and blah, blah, blah. But I also really respect that, that it was a much more realistic ending. I agree. Yeah. I couldn't figure out about Kelly. What was, what was the point of him, you know, always dating black girls? Like I couldn't quite pinpoint, like, what is the point being made here that he did in fact, like, I don't I mean, know. I feel like the point was just to throw in, which this book does in basically every situation, just like kind of complicate things a little more in small ways. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, just sort of this idea that like nothing's black and white and there's grays in every situation. And like Kelly is amazing and their relationship seems great. And like she feels really confident he's with her because of her and not because of her race. But if you look at the history, it that's questionable. Right. So I feel like it was just it was just a tool to add more gray area. But I also think like we all know those people, right? Like I feel like we all know those guys or those girls mm-hmm. who always date someone of a specific race. And it's kind of like it's like some I don't know. And so and so it does make you wonder like is this a fetish? Are you fetishizing them? Like are you like what's the deal here? Yeah. But on the other hand, like, also, what's the problem with that? Like, right. is there a problem with that? And like, we want to be an open society and we want to support all kinds of love. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. And are we reinforcing like existing stere- like, you know, I cultural agree. norms by saying it's weird for you to date outside of your own race consistently? I, I totally, it's so gray. I don't know. It's yeah. a mind fuck. Like it's right. a bend um in a way that's really interesting and I also think it gave you know it helped Alex Alex how would you do you say her other name she changes her name I just always Alex. said it. yeah it was like Alex or yeah it was yeah something weird a different um, um, emphasis I yeah just I just Alex. said Alex yeah me too I did it in my head too um but I think it gives Alex more ammo right to like be distrustful of Kelly mm. um when she can look through his Instagram and see that he's dated all these other black girls like yeah then she feels like she's even more justified to say you shouldn't be with him like he's a bad guy here are all of these reasons and that's one of the reasons right and it's kind of the same kind of ammo that kelly has against alex you know he claims that she is this um you know she comes from a family who always has um people that help their family who are black and they wear a uniform and it's very like plantation ish and then when you read about it you know, it's just so gray. And it's like, I, I thought, you know, that's probably what the author was going for, because I feel like it just makes you really think. It depends mm-hmm. on the perspective. It depends on the situation. And it's like, it's, I guess there is all this gray area. It's very hard because you could twist it in a way to make someone seem super racist. But then if you actually went through the details, you'd be like, no, um, she's not wearing a uniform. Like, she wears this polo so she doesn't get paint on every day. And she's the one who wants to do it because she doesn't want to ruin all her clothes. So yeah, you right. could twist that into a it way was where absolutely it seems... her choice. Right. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so twisted. Well, and I think also like all of those arguments and like, we've got people on both sides feeling very righteous about each of these things. Mm-hmm. And then in the middle, you have Amira who's just trying to get through every day, right? Like just trying to get through her day. Like she's just trying to not get arrested at the supermarket. She's just <laughs> trying to pay her rent. Like she's just trying to like meet a cute guy at a bar, like, and she, you know, and then she's constantly caught in the middle of this, like, well, you're letting this happen to you. Or like, are you aware that this is happening? And she's like, yeah, but it's fine. And I've decided it's fine. And like, I am comfortable with this, like, leave me alone. Right. Um, so I feel like it's so much push and pull on her as the central character. And she's pretty neutral. Like, she's pretty, I mean, up until the very end, although I would even say at the end, like, despite this grand betrayal, that occurs she's like pretty neutral she's just kind of like all right like well I'm leaving yeah I know at the end I'm so surprised how calm she is she's she so actually, calm it's so badass yeah and she's just like okay well like I'm gonna get my stuff and go and I loved yeah. her for that me too because that was absolutely like Alex's nightmare like Alex yeah. is an attention seeker she wants to be really liked she wants to smooth things over and she was never given that opportunity and so she's now she has to live with this forever as it sits and that's probably gonna boil inside of her until she dies yeah I know I 
don't think I don't see how she could ever have let this go because this was even bigger than what happened to her in high school and she never let that go yeah yeah how's she gonna get over it oh another point I wanted to make and I feel like we should wrap up soon but another point I wanted to make is that the husband um (laughs) Peter the the Chamberlain he's just like not even in this book like he's (laughs) such a non-character he like is not aware of any of these things going on he's never home like what what's the deal with that guy (laughs) I don't know he like works at the news station I pictured him as like this always friendly annoyingly cheerful like very um I don't know kind of like a vanilla boring guy but like he's really nice so you can't fault him for anything like just there's not much substance there there was nothing I mean I felt I really felt like there was nothing like we got such so much more character development on like all of the friends that we did on the husband yes I agree which I hope that was an intentional choice but it it I I wanted a little more there like I wanted a little more about their relationship because I I don't know I just I didn't really get why they were together and like what he was so absent yeah I thought it was weird I could yeah I agree there's like nothing about him yeah like basically nothing <laughs> the other another thing I want to mention that I loved about this book is the um, references to technology like people are texting there's this yeah. video it's sent and they're like but did you delete it from the sent folder and I'm like yes exactly like that's so realistic it's a perfect yeah. question to ask the fact yeah. that Amira like doesn't have Instagram is like a really big point of contention among her among her friends who post photos yes. and they like that's right. they like photos they like that attention and they see how many people like it and I thought that was very fun um and made this book very realistic yeah I yeah. agree well Is there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't touch on? I don't think so. No, I just, oh, I wrote down that one of the main themes is girlfriends. (laughs) But yeah, even with Alex and with Amira, they both were very like, um, yeah, they were just, it was fun to read about. I really liked it. I, you know what, as we talk through this book, I feel like there was more here than I gave it credit for because I was, um, thrown off by all of the extra description but I think it 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 is a good book I I changed my vote to a yes wow you've come around (laughs) I've come around let's see how you do after our full discussion at book club okay tomorrow if there's more people that hate it you might the end you're gonna be like you know you know what I'm a thumbs down now I know I'm so easily swayed (laughs) (laughs) no but that's like the point of these discussions I love it yeah well Carrie thank you so much I know you're busy and you've got that cute little BB um so I really appreciate you making some time to talk about this book with me no I love it I love reading and discussing so thank you so much for having me I look forward to our time um at the park tomorrow Ooh, me too happy reading Books with Brooks is produced by Mo Barrow with theme music by Jonathan Allen. Books with Brooks is part of the Press Play Podcast Network, which empowers hosts to create high quality professional shows that inspire and entertain. If you've been dreaming of hosting your own podcast, we can help. Please email content at pressplaypodcast.com to get started today. Please be sure to subscribe to get the latest episodes wherever you listen to podcasts.